discussion. And with this, uh, the next panel topic is role of CHRO in shaping up culture and future of work. And for this, I would like to call on stage, please put your hands together for Mr. Ranjit Kompi, Head HR from Reliance Industries Limited. Can we have a huge round of applause for him? Okay, and uh, with this, the next one, please put your hands together for Mr. Tohin Biswas, CHRO from Imami Limited. Can we have a huge round of applause, everyone? Okay, the next, we have a lady over here. Please put your hands together for the beautiful lady out here, Miss Manisha Kelkar, CHRO from Novoco, Vistas. With this, we have the next member of the panel. Please put your hands together for Mr. Nakul Pathak, Senior EDHR from IFCO India. Okay, the last but not the least, our moderator, please put your hands together for Mr. Mohit Saxena, Head Human Resources from Bajaj Energy. Can we have a huge round of applause for our moderator? Hello. So over to you all. Just take, yeah, start the panel. Thank you so much, guys. Guys, I think all of us have had a great uh, lunch. And uh, I have been participating in the earlier sessions in the morning. So I know it's a very engaging crowd. But uh, the way we had been clapping for ourselves, I thought it was only we who were clapping. <laughs> but I definitely know this is one of the last sessions, one of the most interesting sessions for say. Obviously, because one of me being the moderator, I would pose it as to be the most interesting session. I had heard some comments in the beginning during the last sessions in the morning in the previous day. So somewhere, we feel that this is a... Uh, Some of the young generation people feel that HR is not going to exist, HR is going to die away, that is how it's going to be. But let me then introduce you to this panel which has a decade, 10 decades of experience in the field of HR and we very strongly believe that HR is going to be there here and play a very vital role in shaping up the future of organization or creating a future ready organization. So we are going to have some good interesting discussions with our eminent panel members here as to how we look at shaping the future organization, how we look at shaping the future of HR. Fine. I would also want to set in a context before we begin with. So, just to set the context, I have certain pointers for all of you to think upon and deliberate. We have been through a pandemic era. And in this pandemic era, a lot has changed. Even before the dust could settle down, there was a lot of thinking which had to be done. Organizations had to think very differently what they needed to do. There was a lot of change in terms of reallocation of work, in terms of move towards automation and digitization, in terms of all the aspects of ways of working which came into picture. But I think till now, if we really give credits to the organizations and to the HR teams, they've done a fairly good job in managing the crisis till date today. At least let it be the case in India. That is how we look at it. They've really done a good job. And I think we owe it to them. The way they have actually created that cohesive organization, they've created all the values which are needed in an organization. It's been a splendid job. Now, what's the next move beyond this? How do we go from here? What are the new things which we need to unravel? Is something which we would want to unleash in this discussion as we talk together. So I would now move the discussion towards my panelists who definitely have more wisdom and more knowledge than me and will share from their domains as to how they have been facing all these challenges all throughout. 
my first question would be to our panelists, uh, Mr. Nakul Patak. He's from IFCO, he's the Senior Executive Director HR. And uh, I would want him to share to the audience about how do we think, how, do, how would you build an irresistible company that's driven by innovate, innovation, creativity, and sense of purpose? Because, just one more thing, to add, add to this question which I have asked, for organizations to survive and flourish, I think these are the three main tenets which are very important. The core purpose, innovation, and creativity. So we would like to hear from Nakul, sir. How are you doing it in EFCO? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, friends, I come from an organization which is in the service of farmers. Uh, we are uh, manufacturing and uh, distributing chemical fertilizers. Uh, I'm working with EFCO. So our purpose is very noble because we are serving the farmers and through farmers, uh, you know, we are trying to ensure food security for the country. Because without uh, fertilizers, there cannot be any agriculture. So we were uh, formed way back in 1967 and today we are into 55th year of our existence. So we must have done something, you know, right to be sustainable for this thing. And presently, we are biggest, of course, in the country, and we are biggest uh, uh, in, in cooperative sector. We are, mind you, we are not a company, we are a cooperative sector. So uh, uh, in cooperatives, the success, success stories are not very much, IFCO, Amul, and the, these, the, these are the organizations which have done very well in the uh, cooperative sector. So uh, the purpose, I said, is very noble. And our all HR policies and management uh, you know, decisions are taken, keeping in mind that it starts right from the recruitment stage. We, we you know, do all the AI-based uh, written tests and other things. But when we do the interviews, the emphasis on uh, to select the candidate, which is culturally, you know, who can fit in our organization. We, we, if you meet our employees, they are very grounded, they are very humble, because they have to serve the farmers. In our marketing team, they are all agriculture graduates. We, there are no MBAs because. Uh, basically, our uh, agriculture uh, team has to work with the farmers in the villages. They have to do a lot of ext extension programs, promotional programs. Mind you, because we are not a company, we are not bound by, you know, CSR things or other things. But we are doing so much for the farmers uh, that, uh, you know, our people are already in the, uh, they are always in the field and working with the farmers. And uh, I'll share with you later uh, the one of the huge innovation which we have come up with. So that is for later, but for this thing about the organization I wanted to share. And uh, we are uh, pushing uh, for innovation and creativity so much, it is in the culture of the organization because our management always promotes this. Because without innovation, the industry, any organization cannot survive. And uh, we have a normal, you know, suggestion scheme where all employees participate and we get 3,000, 4,000 suggestions, 40, 50 crores we save by employ, you know, by implementing those suggestions. That is one thing. But we gauge the employee engagement through this scheme. How many employees are participating who are looking for improvement or betterment in the process? So that is the that is more important participation in the scheme. So we always encourage, and with this uh, a, a, the innovation which uh, I'll share with you later. For now, I think. So thank you so much, Nakulji, for sharing good inputs about your organization. So I think uh, as India moves towards becoming a five trillion economy, agriculture sector is going to play a very pivotal role. And we'll need to see agriculture, which has been one of a predominant strength in our country also, 
needs to be flourished and needs to be assimilated with technology and things as we move ahead. So I think there'll be a lot of development which will come in that space as well as we move on. Now, there's a very interesting perspective. Uh, there has been a report uh, which has been released by McKinsey, The New Possible, which speaks about how HR can build the organization of future. Here, it focuses that the top three priorities of HR leaders for the next two years are going to be focused around initiatives that strengthen the organization's ability to drive change, change in leadership, drive culture, and employee experience. So now, when the impetus is so much about this fast-changing world, and we've already been uh, accustomed to a term called VUCA world, that was a term which was coined somewhere in the 1980s, but if you look in the present context, the VUCA world is taken over by a new term given by uh, Jamius Cassio, which says the Bani world. Now, what does Bani world mean? The Bani world speaks about brittle, anxious, non-linear, incomprehensible. That's the state of the situation in which we and companies and organizations are operating in. So HR is not just about HR. Now, HR is more about creating value in the marketplace. So I would now request Ranjit Kompi, our HR head from Reliance, to share some light on how you would look at showing that HR needs to create some value in the marketplace to maintain its existence and to thrive. And also, would you help us understand what should be the traits of the future HR leaders like in this changing context and environment that we, we are in? Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, you contextualize it nicely in terms of the way we are uh, changing. And uh, the way we are changing also enables us or pushes us as HR to look at. Traditionally, uh, in multiple industries that I have worked across, uh, HR has always been an inside out focused organization. Uh, what it means is we have our policies, we have our annual calendars, we have our way to drive performance management, and uh, we have certain ways to tick mark our own goals. When we're talking about value creation for marketplace, it starts with, first of all, value creation for other organization. And that starts with understanding that am I aligned with the way the business head or the business unit that I'm supporting, what he or she is undergoing right now. And I always say that value creation is not about what you think is a value, but what they want as a value. And that value, if you want to understand, you need to understand that, okay, whatever we are doing as a HR, what are the implications that will have on the business, my organization, and the marketplace. Let's start with, like there are five implications and we always talk about it in the business. We have customer implication, we have people implication, we have time implication, cost implication, and process implications. And whatever we do as HR, if I can understand what exactly, whatever I do, okay, what are the implications that will happen on my business, I will start understanding that, okay, which of this will be a value addition to my business head. I'll, I'll take an example. We all go to campuses, right? And we all go there to pick up a person who we think could be adding value to my system. But how much value addition that I've done to my ca that campus? How much of input that we've given in advance so that I can get in return? I, I always call it value creation is a journey of paramarthame swarth, right? If you create a value in the marketplace, in the system, right, the value will be automatically created in the entire process. There is a beautiful study by uh, Gloat, okay? It's an internal e excellent company which talks about value creation in terms of the ta internal talent marketplace. And you should study, uh, uh, re read about a case study that they've published on Schneider Electric about how HR created a marketplace, a value for internal talent, okay? So that they could build the talent internally that talent is available readily for the businesses to pick and choose upon. So rather than we going out, we running after a business uh, target and then finding a person, you find the target first, keep the particular technical proficiency ready with, the, with your businesses, and whenever they need to plug in based on the uh, re business requirement or their goals, you already made the talent available. So you're actually putting the horse before the cart, right, rather than the other way around. 
And I think that's where, when you start looking at these perspectives, is I, I start seeing the value creation happens. And the way the CHROs can drive it is basically having, understanding the system's thinking. How all these things are linked together? How am I actually making sure that whatever changes are happening outside, what are the implications that are going to happen on my business? Can I see beyond the horizon? And I can, can I direct it to the last HR executive who might be handling maybe 100 people, 200 people? Can I instill this value creation as a thought process in his or her mind? And he not only pushes, so okay, how many employee connects have I done? Or how many attritions that I've said? Rather than looking at that as an input indicator, can I start looking at an output indicator? You may not be able to own any of these right now in the first stage. It's okay, that's not a problem. But at least when you start looking at it, and we always say this, whatever you focus, you can improve. So if you start focusing upon that, that actually can happen. And I can give one example from our own business. So I recently shifted from Reliance Retail to Reliance New Energy Business. But in Reliance Retail, I was um, heading HR uh, for uh, one of our fashion lifestyle business. You would have heard of Azure.com and Trends as Shops. So what we looked at is when in the pandemic, we saw that more and more people were buying online rather than coming to our shops. So while it was good for my Azure.com as a business, but it was not good for a lot of brick and mortar businesses that we had set in. We are paying huge rents to it. So what is HR could do in terms of bringing value to that? So I, we had two choices. Either we throw out the people, or we value add into those people. So we said, okay, what is that we can do so that yeah, we can save people's jobs as well as make sure that the business not actually add cost to it. So we changed the way people interact on the floor. Okay. And that's what HR could do in terms of changing their performance management parameters, in terms of their capability to work upon, in terms of how they are evaluated and how they're rewarded. And in the entire process, two things happened. Because we had a business as an entire value creation in mind and not just job saving. Two things happened. We had customers who were much more happy right now. Our NPS went up. And you can read about it in the Reliance annual report for the last year, where it has come out as a case study. And second, of course, is what I always talk about, is when you increase the customer delight, the customer pays you more. So what it actually happened is the average ticket size for us, okay, but what is the average invoice, the average bill amount for us, went up substantially. And that substantially is 37% without actually incurring any marketing cost. So I always say this, that if you start looking at it, that okay, what are the implications of what I do as HR, how do I do it? How do I create value for my employees, for my business? And in terms of the outside market, it all comes back to us and helps us. And of course, we also end up getting a lot of accolades. Now, as a CHRO, what you need to do for tomorrow as thing is three things that I think is very important. One is having the strategic thinking approach, looking at beyond the horizon. What exactly is happening? How my business will get impacted tomorrow if these continue, things continue? And how do I bring it back and get my people to align with it. Second, not take business as a business plan from the CEOs, but participate in that. Participate in the discussion so that you can be instrumental in devising the people levers which are required for it and value add into it. And that you would do only if you have a strong financial acumen. In fact, I always suggest a lot of HR leaders that there is a beautiful book by Ram Charan. It says, what your CEO wants you to know. Beautiful book. Please read it. It actually talks about the expectation that the CEO has from all of us, including the CHROs, and then pick up in the build of the finances. These three things will enable the CHRO to run his team as a business rather than a cost center. Thank you so much, Ranjit ji. And so I think this makes sense. So if uh, some of us had doubts, is HR going to exist? Is HR going to be there? I think Ranjit has rightly answered the question, saying that if you're not making yourselves upskilled, if you're not able to contribute in making strategic decisions for the business, definitely you will be part of that fraternity which may not be existing in that organization. So it's very important that we constantly also upskill ourselves rather than just upskilling employees in the organization. Now coming to one very important facet, as you speak organizations, culture becomes a very talked about word. It's the buzzword around and people talk a lot about culture. People link it with organizations. 
So what is culture actually? So culture, uh, in order to summarize it, I would say it's the foundation on which exceptional financial performance is built. So if you have a strong culture, the companies are definitely going to be profitable. Profit is an outcome of a positive culture. Profit is not a means by which a company is going to work. But if a company has a strong culture, it is definitely also going to be good on the financial index. And there's a research which says that companies with top quartile cultures, which have been measured by McKinsey's health uh, index, put a return to stakeholder shareholders ratio 60% higher than the median companies and 200% higher than the bottom uh, quartile companies. So companies are more than five times more likely to have a successful transformation when leaders have role modeled the behavior and changes they want their employees to make. So culture is such an integral part of the organization and of leadership. This brings me to one more important uh, question which I would like to put up to uh, Tuhinji. Now, why is culture so difficult to change? What are the signs of toxic workplace as a CHRO, how would you influence the and drive the change in culture? Thank you and good afternoon to all of you. I think there's a very famous statement by Peter Drucker. I think we all know this. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Okay, and that's very true. You may have a wonderful strategy and very well-defined strategy, but if your culture of the organization or the culture of the team is not good, you know, that strategy is of no use. You know. Why it is so difficult for culture to change in an organization? Because the organization grows to multiple kind of stages in the organization. You know, two important things which really can change the organization culture is the value system of the organization and how do you want to do the business? It's very important for the employer or the promoters to understand that how do you want to do the business? in this world of multifaceted, uh, you know, world, where we have different kind of competitions in the business. It's very important. So we go through a multiple uh, stages in the organization. We start probably with a one-man show. Then we want to become a professional organization. Then we can become an evolved organization. When, if you look at a startup, people join the organization because they know it's a startup culture, okay? They don't ask what kind of culture they join the organization as a startup culture. But when you become big, when you become a professional, try to become a professional organization, and from professional organization, you want to become a world organization, that's where the culture plays a very important role. That's why we have to realize this, yes, if we don't change, you know, the other organization will change us. So that becomes a very important, you know, prominent imperative to see that how can we change the culture from a professional organization to an evolved organization, okay? We have seen many of, for example, let's take organization of ours, you know. As an organization, our products are very well known. It's well known products and Imami's household name and it's a uh, diverse organization and, uh, you know, we have multiple products. But when we look at the employee branding, you know, we have to still do a lot of work. Like if you look at Unilever, Unilever as a brand is here, and also the employee brand is over here, okay, at the same level. Whereas many of the organization where they the brand of the organization is, or the product brand of the organization is somewhere here, but the employee brand is somewhere here. So that's the difference where you have to bring in, you know, how do you actually bring up the employee branding in the organization, which will define the culture of the organization, you know? The culture, as I told you, it's not going to change overnight. It has to be nurtured to develop, okay? And each and every stage, it's very important for the CHR of the organization to actually, he becomes the catalyst, he becomes the moderator, he becomes the mentor to the organization to identify what kind of culture we have. So when we start growing, basically, I've seen in many organizations, big organizations, including our organization, every function tries to define their own culture. So the job of the CHRO becomes very important to actually consolidate and say, this is the culture what we are really looking at, okay? 
continuously thrive with the senior management or the promoters of the organization or the leaders to say that this is what the culture we need to build in. He plays a very, very important role. He's a mentor of the organization. Okay. Coming back to this toxic culture, today what is the toxic culture of the organization? Now, if you see that employees doing a lot of hush-hush regarding the security of the jobs, uh, you know, they're not really motivated to work in the organization. They always feel insecure about themselves. They cannot openly speak. This, the leadership team or the management knows about it and they're doing nothing. That's where the toxic culture comes in, okay? If you look at, let me just go a little back and say that if you look at a baby boomers, if you ask them what is toxic culture, they would say that probably yes, every organization has and we get used to it. If you look at Gen X people, they also th try to accommodate or adjust with the culture which is there. They said, yes, there are problems, but still, that's okay. But the question is about the millennials and the Gen Z people who would not really compromise on the culture. And that's where you have to really work towards building a culture of the organization, which is very, very open, productive, you know, where people can look forward to join this company. We did a lot of work in building the image of the company. We were in the social media. We did a lot of work to make ourselves visible. We built the EVP of the organization. You know, we came up with best of the practices and everything. You know, but one thing which really look for the, the employees look for is the respect in the organization. You know, and that they get from. You have many of the ambition box or your glass doors and everything giving a rating of the organization. But it's very important for us to give message to the talent world that what kind of culture we want to build in. You know, intent is more important than what you actually do. Okay. So for me, answering your question, I think the CHRO's role is a very, very like this. You know, he can preach the management and say, this is what we need to do. You know, there are multiple things to implement in the organization, but if you understand what business requires, and I think it should be very, very important for the organization and for the business people to understand this is the culture we have to build in. We should not be competing with the competition and say this is the culture we want to build in because you may not have that, those value system in you, okay? So it is very important to be aware of and then come up with a kind of a strategy and what kind of culture we want to build in, yeah? I, very well said, Tohinji. So I think, see, uh, one important point which uh, Mr. Tohin shares is that there's nothing which is ready-made. You need a lot of assimilation, integration, working closely with the business, working closely with the people, and the uh, context in which you are to create that kind of a culture which can be enriching and engaging. So you always need to keep your eyes and ears open. You need to understand the pulse of people and the organization and play a role. So somewhere the CHRO or the HR head of the company is like an is like a doctor to the organization. He is actually seeing that is the organization a healthy organization, or is it something which is going to deteriorate and disappear from the market in coming next few years? So that is where I would again like to emphasize that being HR people and being in the HR fraternity, we need to look at the larger aspects of how do we change or shift our gaze to being a strategic business partner. How do we get onto the boardrooms, sit with the senior management of the company and question norms or question the rational behind ideas which they're putting up in the interest of organization and in the interest of talent or people who are very important. So now with all these changes which are coming in, I think the CHRO has got to look at multiple dimensions of change which are happening be it in terms of people, be it in terms of technology, be it in terms of automation, be it in terms of learning and development. So one very important aspect which comes into picture is how agile is your business? How do you build the agility coefficient between, within your organization? So as per a survey by McKinsey done in 2018, six, even at that time, and I think the number is still higher now, 66% of the executives actually feel that there's a gap in terms of addressing the skills which are required for automation and digitization. That is one of the top 10 priorities of the CEOs and CHROs as of today. 
that how do we bridge the gap between automation and digitization? And what is the level of automation and digitization which my organization needs to have? Because today even that is a challenge to choose upon from the varied sources of options that you're thrown with, you're left confused as to what should be my digitization and automation strategy. But uh, on this, I would uh, invite my uh, panel member Manisha Kelkaji to speak on uh, as the world is moving into digitization and automation, what is the role of CHRO in shaping a forward looking culture? Thank you. And may I request the organizers to reduce the flashlights here and uh, put it on this beautiful audience, please, because I don't want that we are talking and I don't get to see because I have few questions with which I want to start. Can we please reduce these flashlights so at least I can see hands raised when I ask some questions to the audience? Anybody here from organizing team? Ah, beautiful. Great. Now we can see all of you. And uh, as my colleagues have talked about some of the other important elements of HR and what role CHROs play in uh, shaping the culture, etc. I think one important aspect that's changing worldwide is digitization. And uh, hot topic really today is the open AI and chat GPT. So may I know, and please be honest when I'm asking these questions now, and just raise of hand is good, and please humor me, be with me, <laughs> participate. Uh, how many of us here have an account on OpenAI? How many of us have ChatGPT account? Ooh, very few. That's dangerous. Not a good sign for HR fraternity. All of us, all of us in this room, if you want future in HR, must have chat GPT account and we must experience firsthand what it offers. Now the second question, how many of us are really using it for getting information or data or anything for that matter in our workspace? Two, three, four, five, lovely. So almost all who have the account are using. How many are using for the children's assignments? Anybody? <laughs> So that has become a very controversial uh, topic really worldwide and I believe they're working on a technology which can help us catch when kids submit assignments which are produced by chat GPT. So that's a different subject. But uh, and now that's about digitization and the new thing that's happening in the world when we look at HR. How many of us here we have I think representation from many different uh, companies and sectors. So how many of us work in a completely automated environment, have end-to-end -end HRMS to manage employee life cycle, hiring to, uh, to FNF, recruitment happens, okay, recruitment is automated, employee life cycle is automated, PMS automated, no, we have very few people who are working in an automated environment today, okay, right. So, fine. So when you look at HRMS, what it does today, so I wanted to stress a little bit on the difference between how we understand automation and what really is digitization. So when we look at any HRMS, when I asked you, do you have a, um, a automation for managing employee life cycle, that means right from hiring till the person leaves the organization, everything will be in this system. He doesn't need to come to your desk. He can send a a request on the system that will get processed, etc. And that's for PMS, that's for e-learning, all of that. But the difference with digitization is going to be that instead of just automating the hiring process, we will start relying or taking decisions basis the output that the system gives us. We don't rely on the system for selection decisions. Selection decisions still rest with all the interview panels. When it comes to talent management PMS, none of us can imagine, can we depend on our automated PMS system to throw recommendations on who are the people who should be promoted this year? What will our bosses do? What will be managers' reaction in the organization if we tell them, no, no, you can't tell me who should be promoted. System will give a recommendation to me who are the people who are eligible for promotion based on the data which is there in the system. So 
that's the difference we are talking about between automation and digitization. And I guess so far, what we have experienced is automation. We know everybody's objectives are on the system, manager reviews on the system, but we are not using the system to throw the output to us. So, uh, and in this context only, when I was uh, watching one of the videos of uh, Microsoft's president, Brad Smith, he's, he gave one of the interview in the World Economic Forum last month that happened. And they were talking about technology and obviously chat GPT, very big topic today. Uh, he, of course, interview was long, but three things I felt were worth noticing. The first thing that he said is chat GPT, by the way, some of us have experienced and some of us who have experienced will know how beautiful that product is. But Microsoft was not expecting that humankind will adapt to chat GPT so fast. So he said it is almost as if future has been pulled forward by a decade. So they were not thinking that we will immediately start using it. We will, so many people, non-technology people will have accounts there and we will use it for work. And uh, the second part is when it comes to differentiating, I think his definition I really liked in terms of what differentiates the uh, AI from the earlier automation. He said this brings in two elements which were not there so far. First one is critical thinking. Because so far what we have seen is just automation, data gathering, putting it in the format that we want. But what AI does is it brings in critical thinking and also creative expression. So the system which is capable of doing some bit of processing and throwing the output back in a creative way. So you can imagine uh, that, and that's why there is a lot of talk about after digitization, what's going to happen to organizations and roles and how roles are going to change and all of that. And after experiencing chat GPT, I think that threat is not true really. You will, we will still, still need human minds and we will uh, still need people to take decisions but a lot will become easier. And the third element that my colleague also touched upon when he was talking was uh, that India today, by the way, our average age as a nation, any guesses? What's our average age as a nation? Anybody knows? Who said 29? Bang on. Our average age today is 29, which is not there with any other country. So for three, three whole decades, can you imagine what three decades means? Means 12, 12, 12, three, 12 into three years. None of the country is going to be able to beat us when it comes to human capital. Many first world countries, you know, are struggling with this age issue and the source of intellectual capital for that matter. So what he said is what Saudi Arabia is for the world when it comes to oil. India is going to be for the world when it comes to engineers and technology upgradations. So that's a very beautiful thing to hear, but what that means for all of us sitting here is, we are going to have lot of innovations, lot of innovations which will happen here, lot of people here who will want to take that risk, and of obviously existing organizations and setups have to provide them those platforms, and then therefore, again, uh, the responsibility in terms of holding that space and creating that structure in the organization falls on the CHRO. And I was thinking before I move on to talking about how the role will change, let's take a moment to reflect on how the role has evolved so far. So uh, if you look at me, I started my career in last decade like technically. So <laughs> in these 26, 27 years, what I have seen is moving from the typical personnel because I started my career in a plant. So from IR to moving to training and development to bringing in more focus on HR processes, core processes like PMS, etc. Then lot of emphasis on benefits, benefits administration, HR automation, creating continuous learning organizations. As our economy went through many ups and downs, many consolidations across industries happened. Then there was a huge importance for OD and change management. And right now, if you see, there's a lot of thing about creating continuous learning and future ready organizations. So where we look at, if we look at the role of CHRO in two lines, if I were to say, or how I at least experience in my day-to-day -day life, I was to tell you. One very important part is you are responsible at the strategic table to ensure that your organization is moving in the right direction. 
first very important is the strategic direction of the business and you are of course you are one of the CXO you share the responsibility for that second is as I said being future ready is the thing managing these different generation dynamics and providing a common platform where people old people like me also feel comfortable and youngsters also feel comfortable is a challenge it's not easy it's not easy to have one policy that will take care of every generation but provide that ensure that we have right talent at the right time because with the number of opportunities and competition increasing it's very important that we have right people when we want to do certain experimentation or pursue a certain project for innovation and last is uh, being a very low paid coach for other CXOs <laughs> because if you pro hire another coach from outside you have to pay a lot for the external coach but typically CHRO ends up doing this role and doesn't get paid extra it's part of the salary only but that also happens a lot and uh, so that's where it is right now and since this topic is about digitization I had tried two things one I tried these organizers, uh, organizers that can I uh, log in digitally I mean do I have to travel here because you're talking about digitization and imagine I had to fly from Mumbai here to talk to you all but they said no 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 this is in person conference so I said okay I respect that so I will come in person to talk about digitization uh, but it's always nice to connect uh, in person and the second thing I did is because I am also one of the person who raised hand when they said that okay do you use chat GPT and open AI to ask questions I also did put this question in the open AI saying that role of HR in 2030 or role of CHRO in after digitization and there was a lot of English but I must say this tool is very very effective because if you want to do research on any subject and you on the same subject if I was to do research and go after any of the Harvard and McKinsey articles I will land with at least 10 15 page article McKinsey maybe seven page article because they know 15 pages nobody reads but Harvard will be a very long article but chat GPT gave you gave me exactly one page thing and there was a lot of English written there but if I was to share with you the essence there were four things that were highlighted that will change post digitization and by the way I agree with the AI <laughs> these are the things which will change so the first one is a lot around very obvious things of communication information access transparency in the entire organization because everybody will have access to all the information it will be very difficult to contain any information when you get into digitization there won't be one advantage is there won't be any fights between sales and uh, logistics nobody will ask the sales guy will know where my shipment is and when it's going to reach customer on a system but at the same time a lot of access to all policies etc so at one level driving collaboration in the organization will become easier but ensuring that all this information is processed rightly and that is and also because of this level of transparency building a culture of trust is also possible but this cannot happen unless you have a manager who holds the space who will tell the employee that you're looking at this on information what it means you have access to this how you use it and only when that connecting link is there between manager and everything that is available we'll be able to build this culture of trust and therefore there will be change and I think that change has already started happening in terms of the core leadership competencies that we look for so I uh, remember during the COVID time a lot of us all of us have arranged sessions for our managers on how to be effective on virtu in virtual meetings but I don't know at least in my organization I I couldn't think of doing this because it was very overwhelming the COVID time first to think about people then to think about business continuity but we also need to train our managers on how to work in a flexible environment they are not used to seeing one person in office on the Monday other person is going to show up on Thursday somebody is working at night and sending me report early morning other person is doing something else how are they going to cope so there is a huge need when it when we talk about flexibility there is a again the role of manager plays a very big role and it's going to change and it is up to HR by the way to understand this change is happening and train our managers beforehand on these to be able to manage these things 
The third part was innovation. My colleague also spoke. Yeah, even in something like a, a fertilizer industry, yeah, in the innovation is so important and it's going to be important for anybody and everybody who wants to survive. Even my company, which is a very traditional cement company, if we don't innovate, it's difficult to survive in this competitive environment. But with innovation also comes a lot of responsibility because we will need to mobilize those many people on different projects. When we don't need them, what do you do them? How many of you noticed there were tel some, uh, something like 10, 12 ba days back, there was a big news about Microsoft, Google, Amazon, laying off some 10,000, 10, 18,000, 12,000 people. It happened. Even these companies which are doing very well, they had to take this difficult decision of laying off these people. All this happened because at the time when you get excited about some project, you're getting people. So the responsibility of HR increases because my colleague also talked about gig workers, etc. And that's going to be reality because when we know that we're working on a certain project, I need this skill set for two years. Then you hire and do a contract with them only for two years so that you don't get infamous again in the print saying that you sack some thousand people. And the last pillar, which I'm forgetting, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Just be with me for a minute. Yeah, last pillar, I believe, which has been uh, discussed even in this forum in last uh, couple of days is employee engagement. Uh, of course, it's highly misunderstood. Employee engagement is not about doing holy party. I'm sure all of you must be having different unique ways you're going to celebrate holy in your offices now. But it is not about the holy party. It is about how are we observing and listening to our people. I'm sure all of us have the employee engagement survey. We do annual surveys, we do third party surveys, we do in-house dipstick, then we do focus group discussion, action planning, and drive those improvement areas during the year. But how many of us can put our heart, hand on our heart and say that those actions are driven in spirit and letter? Do we do that in the organization? So we struggle to respond to employee needs even when we have this kind of engagement uh, data coming up, imagine in digitized world, we will have machines who will read a person's face and say, Manisha is looking, not looking very choppy today. She's looking down. Ranjit is very happy <laughs> today. Or, you know, three of your team members are consistently delaying submitting your reports. Or there is, there is some, somebody in the team who is only working in the nights, is not working during the day. Something is wrong. So this kind of data is going to come and our response to act on data will have to be also equally fast. If we don't act, then that information is of no use to us. And therefore, one big change that will happen in HR is this CHRO, the glorified CHRO's role will get a little bit diluted. We will have to do a lot of delegation of authority to everybody in HR. Because each HRBP, who, whatever team you're supporting, you're supporting a team of 200 or 1,000 people, you will have day-to-day -day feel of people and you will have to be given the freedom to do what you think is right to do with your uh, team of people. You cannot wait for a CHRO to change your policy or company to give you a go-ahead. No. Very fast action, delegation of authority, speed of decision-making and actions will make a lot of difference. And when we all started our careers, I'm sure uh, there was, I'm forgetting which book this chapter was, but there was a cha very nice chapter on, of course, I didn't like it then when I studied, but it talked about uh, adopting information management or something in the organization. I think it was part of OB book only. But I remember very clearly what it said because it was very relevant even at the beginning of my career is that you don't adopt any information management or any system blindly. You have to first look at what is the kind of technology you are adopting? Which are the tasks and transactions it's going to affect in the organization? Who are the people who are going to do these tasks and transactions? Are they equipped? Do they need skill set change? Do they need attitude change? All of that. And as a result of all this, is there any structural change required? So you see it is all four pillars. It is not just SAP leke aao, Ariba leke aao, e-commerce leke aao. It is about studying the entire effect, the ecosystem and then taking a decision. So HR, in a way, as we move into digitized world and world which is going to progress and change very fast, I think we will have to literally create a left brain and a right brain. You know, left brain which will continuously hold with the 
hardware part, the system thinking part, which will keep looking at organization as a system, is everything going well, not, where we need to bring in what change, which piece needs correction. And the second very important, we just can't forget, because everybody else is likely to forget, is the software, which is the empathy piece. HR, and I'm not saying CHRO, really, in future, when we look at organizations, culture building, it will be the entire team, even the last man standing in HR, will be capable of making a huge difference in the kind of employee experiences we create, and therefore, the kind of culture we nurture in the company. So, yes, this is what briefly I had thought about on the topic. So, I think very deep, interesting insights something coming from the chat GPT source, structuring it out so well, giving us a very, very intellectual outlook of how automation and digitization needs to work in the current context. So though the role of CHRO gets diluted like what Manisha just referred to a short while ago, but I heard a silver lining in that statement that even that role getting diluted, you will still need to empower a lot of people in your team. So now we are moving away from the traditional concept of organizations where you add hierarchical structures to an ecosystem which is about a network of collaborators. We are working in a more participative system and so that is where engagement, empowerment or enabling everyone becomes very important. So I think we have had a very good engaging uh, discussion till now but I will come back to Nakulji because he had one story on innovation to speak about and I don't want to miss that so that it becomes more interesting. Yeah. Uh, Madam said that uh, in fertilizer there is a, we are thinking about innovation. But friends, it is such a huge innovation that you will all uh, be proud of. Uh, we, the normal uh, urea you must have heard, which we use, its use efficiency is hardly 30-35%. So if you use 100 kg in the field, if the farmer is using, only 30-35% is taken by the plant. Rest 70% goes to pollute the soil and the subsoil water and due to volatilization, the you know, greenhouse gases are generated. So out of 100 kg, just 30% uptake by the plant. So uh, we, we are doing, you know, so good in this. We are the top 25% uh, share is ours in the country. But our management was not satisfied that we, we should must uh, come out with something better. So we have, uh, uh, you know, our managing director was attending a conference in US and he saw a Indian uh, gentleman presenting a paper on nano this thing. And it struck to him that this is the person we want. So we uh, got that person here and within one year of we set up a, a lab in our uh, Kalol plant near Ahmedabad and in one year the product was there and it was used in 11,000 location for testing purpose and we got the permission the, because the results were so good. The yield was 8 to 10 percent more and there was hardly any pollution because it was uh, uh, it is a uh, in liquid form. It is uh, used foliar uh, form. It is sprayed on the plants, and uh, that 500 ml bottle replaces the 45 kg bag of urea. Will you believe it? So that uh, the, the the out of that uh, 70 kg, 70 percent was going to pollute. But here the use efficiency is 90 percent. Out of 500 ml, if 90% is used, hardly anything is left to pollute. So it is such a good innovation, the farmers get more yield. And the main thing is that the subsidy on urea is huge. Government is spending, around last year it spent 2.5 lakh crore on subsidy. Because the selling price of urea is 266 rupees of one bag. And its actual price is more than 2,000 rupees. And this product, the, without any subsidy, we are selling it at 225 rupees bottle. So there is huge saving in subsidy. We are importing fertilizer and we are spending foreign exchange on this. So, so far, we have got permission and we have set up the plant. Now you can imagine from lab to, you know, production, 
within one year and we have produced 6 crore bottles of that uh, nano urea liquid. 6 crore means we have saved 30 lakh tons of uh, urea which in terms of subsidy only comes to 12,000 crore rupees. And we are, our other, our other two plants are also operational now and we are going to put up three more plants. So in very new, near future, we will have capacity to produce uh, 30 crores bottle, which will uh, result into uh, savings of 70,000 crores, which is huge. So this product is such a good innovation for farmer, the cost is low, the yield is more, the, the resilience of the plant is more. When the rainstorm and other things come, this, uh, the plant where this nano urea is used, they remain, you know, standing, others become flat. So government is saving huge on subsidy. Government is now pushing it. Even Prime Minister mentioned in his, one of his speech. And uh, so this is the, the type of innovation and the uh, advantage of having a culture of innovation that, uh, you know, companies thrive on. So this is... So, so nice to hear this good example. So ultimately, it actually relates down to despite the technology, despite the automation, despite everything coming in place, I think the uh, MD or the director of the company spotted out a person who had that innate talent to create something different, innovative, unique. So just, just one thing I wanted to share, that uh, this, uh, the top leadership, no, no, the good leaders, they have this uncanny, you know, uh, to, uh, to find the talent and he got the right person unfortunately that person is no more with us he left but the the, the culture continues we are coming out now with DAP which will be still more you know huge innovation it is under trial and the results are good because for DAP uh, these are the main fertilizer NPK this urea and DAP for the agriculture so DAP there is no raw material available in the country we don't have rock uh, phosphate and the potash is not there. So everything is imported. We are dependent on uh, imports. But with this DAP, nano DAP, everything will be replaced. The cost will come down. And see the savings in transportation. Taking a uh, 45 gauge bag and compare it with the, taking a 40, 500 ml bottle. So this is the, uh, you know, innovation. And this is first time in the world People really wonder why not USA or Japan or China or where we have patented it and this is first time in the world. Thank you. So very interesting insights. So ultimately it lands down that the reason for human existence is that they're able to think creatively, they're able to be innovative. So definitely human race is going to stay for a long time and people and CHROs for that matter are not going to become extinct and they'll play a vital role in shaping up future organizations because the unique knack of finding human beings lies within human beings. So with this, I think I would like to say that we've consumed the one hour given to the panels. We will open the house for question answers because uh, I know a lot of you would have some or the other queries or questions to ask. I would want my panel to please uh, enlighten them. So open to the audience for any questions. It's been an overdose post-lunch, been a sleepy session, or uh, probably the topics have gone overhead. <laughs> no Are we guys done? Sure. Okay, so uh, we are end with this, uh, our last panel session. Can we have a huge round of applause for our panel members? Thank you so much, guys, for your support. And uh, now, uh, okay. So now we would be doing the felicitation, and the, for the felicitation, I would like to call on stage. Please put your hands together for Mr. Venkat Machavlu, founder and CEO from iQuadra. Can we have a huge round of applause for him?
Okay, so please put your hands together for Mr. Ranjit Kompi. Can we have a huge round of applause, everyone? Mr. Dohin Biswas. Ms. Manisha Kelkar. Everyone, come on. Mr. Nakul Patak. Last but not the least, please put your hands together for our moderator, Mr. Mohit Saxena. Thank you so much, Mr. Venkat. And uh, thank you so much uh, to all the panel members. Okay, you guys can have a picture.